there's like now I'm all choked up. It's like watching babies being born. <laughs> just kidding. I do cry every time I see a baby born. There's just something about a person who says, I'm gonna give everything, I'm gonna give my all, I'm gonna devote my entire life to Jesus. Wow. And, and it's weird because this is the first, well, this is uh, last year, Palm Sunday, was the first Sunday of the COVID shutdown. And, and after the COVID shutdown, some people leaned in to Jesus. Some people cl started clinging to Jesus. Some people said, I don't know what this means, but I'm gonna hold on to Jesus because I know he's got this. And then there, were, there was a group of people that turned away, went the other way, said, I don't know how God can even be in this, and they went over there. There's also a group of people that are in this in-between land. They're in the place of, you know what, I'm just shutting down myself. I don't even know what's going on anymore. I'm gonna distance myself. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, just, I'm not even gonna pursue God. I don't know what's real. I don't know what's not real anymore. I think though that we can all say that all of us in this room after the past year, we know a little bit more about what it means to be separated, to be isolated, to be alone, to not be allowed to do the things that we want to do, to not be allowed to associate with the people that we wanna associate with. And today what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about a group of men who were experts at social distancing. They weren't experts at social distancing because they chose that. They were actually uh, thrust into a situation that they didn't choose and, and they had to alienate themselves. They had to pull away. They were rejected by their communities, excluded from all social interactions with others and forced to live in isolation. And they were the least important people in their community. They were so unimportant that they almost became invisible. And this group of men, they lived on the border, and some of you are seeing the title of my sermon, like, please don't talk about the border. Not in this country, anyway. So I'm not gonna talk about anything political, but I am gonna talk about a border. And this border was between Samaria and Galilee, but it really represents this border that some of us live on. The place that's neither here nor there. When someone lives on the border, they don't reside in either place. And even today, a lot of people, maybe even some people in this room are living on the border. It's pretty isolating and sometimes it's lonely, but Jesus travels to the border to find those who live there. So I'm gonna ask Dawn to come up and she's going to share our scripture reading this morning, which is taken from the gospel of Matthew, I'm sorry, of Luke chapter 17. Good morning. Luke chapter 17. As Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered the village there, 10 men with leprosy stood at a distance crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. He looked at them and said, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, didn't I heal 10 men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. So probably most of you in this room have heard about leprosy. 
It's a skin disease, and in the Bible, in ancient Israel, it was a skin disease that could have been a variety of things. But the thing about leprosy is that it's on the exterior. You can actually see it. You can't hide it from anybody. People know if you have leprosy. It also disfigures your body. And the law stated in that time that lepers could not be around other people. They couldn't live with their families. They couldn't see their friends. They couldn't socialize in their communities. And when people walked near the lepers or when the lepers came near to anybody else, you know what they had to do? They had to make an announcement. They had to make an announcement. And the announcement was this, unclean. So imagine if you came into this room, into the sanctuary right now, and there was a leper in this room, and the leper would shout out, I want all of you to say it, unclean, say it again. Unclean. They had to say it loud enough so that the people would hear and that they would all turn away and go the other direction. The unclean and the clean could not mix. Their identity and their only reputation was their uncleanness. And within this group of 10 rejected men and 10 outcasts, there was one who was even lower than all the rest. He was the lowest of the low. He would have been doubly excluded. Nine of them were Jews and one was a Samaritan. And the Samaritan, prior to contracting leprosy, he would have already known what it was like. He would have been familiar with rejection. He would have been familiar with what it meant to be excluded, to feel less than, to be the lowest on the totem pole. The Jews believed that Samaritans were spiritually and ritually unclean, so they did everything they could do to avoid them, to not touch them, to lose contact with them. And before these men contracted leprosy, they were enemies and they hated each other. But isn't it interesting how their common stigma their common pain, that their common isolation is actually what brought them together. Some of you remember the health crisis, probably, in the 1980s. Do you remember what it was? It was called HIV AIDS. And there was a lot of fear surrounding the disease, and I'll never forget that feeling of what is this that people are talking about? You heard it on the news, it, you know, it was just, it was very scary and there were all these different ideas about where it came from and for me, it was very scary about how, how it was passed around. And then people started saying, well, we don't really know how you get it. So you can get it from maybe somebody sneezing, maybe you can get it from somebody hugging or kissing you even on the cheek. I remember I was supposed to uh, play at my cousin's, I was supposed to play and sing at my cousin's funeral, sorry, her wedding. That was a really weird thing that just came out. I don't know what happened. Anyway, look at your notes. Uh, I was supposed to play at her wedding. And it was a very exciting time for my cousin. And so uh, we were all planning and figuring out what they wanted me to sing. And I received a phone call. And the phone call was about two weeks before the wedding. And on the other end of the phone was my, my uncle. And he said, hey, listen, uh, I just want to tell you that it's all off. Don't ask any questions. Done. I was like, what? And my mind was spinning. Like, what happened? They must have had a really big fight. I don't understand what's going on. I ended up finding out a couple weeks later that my cousin had AIDS. So she was formerly a drug user. So she contracted AIDS through a needle. And I'll never forget that feeling of, how could this happen to someone I know? And then, then all these things run through your mind, like what does this mean to her and her life? And I knew what it meant for her life. So I remember talking to my friend and, and I said, you know, what are we going to do about, about my cousin? Like, what are we, I want to go see her, but I'm really scared. Because I don't want to get AIDS. 
But, and I think if I go there, that even if I hug her, that possibly that I might get AIDS. And I'm very scared of that, and I'm not sure what to do. And she was in her house, and she was completely isolated. Nobody was going to see her. The only people that were there were her immediate family. And finally, my best friend, I, I, I can't not go see her. So we decided that it was more important to get rid of our fear and to go see Rita, so we went to see her. And Rita, it was her birthday, and she was turning 30. And so I remember walking in, and if you've ever seen anybody who has AIDS, they're, they're very emaciated. And so I went in to see her and was shocked, and I remember hugging her, and the first thing that went through my mind is, I'm gonna get AIDS. I know that sounds terrible, but that was my feeling. And I remember hugging her, and she hugged me so hard, and I felt like I was gonna break every bone in her body, but she wouldn't let me go, so I didn't let her go. And I remember we brought a cake in, and we put candles on it, and she looked at all the candles, and she blew them out, and she, she said, you know, I, I can't believe this is my, my birthday. I used to be so pretty. Now look at me, and then she started sobbing. Why am I telling you all of this? Listen, Rita did pass away, Rita is in the arms of God. She knew Jesus. But I'm telling you this story because I want you to understand that feeling isolated is real and that these men were real men. These men weren't just a story in the Bible. They were 10 lepers who were totally rejected and isolated from everybody that they loved. And they came together as one group of men who were hurting and in pain and had to cry out unclean their whole lives. But they heard something. They heard that Jesus was, was coming. How they heard about him, I don't know, but Jesus had a reputation. And they were waiting for him. So when Jesus walked into the village on that border between Samaria and Galilee, he heard the voices of 10 Lepers saying in unison, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. They did not proclaim unclean to Jesus. They changed their cry. Instead of using that word that separated them and caused them pain, they cried out for compassion. Instead of hiding from Jesus, they wanted Jesus to see them. They had hidden on the border for so long. But this time, they needed Jesus to look at their disfigurement. Because maybe if Jesus looked at them, he would see their condition, and he would have mercy upon them, and he would rescue them from this remote border land. The place that was really between life and death. You see, the border is the place where you're alive, but you're really not living. And just like these lepers, maybe some of you are living on the border. You've been hiding. You've been living under the radar. You've been trying to go unnoticed, and you've been hoping beyond hope that Jesus doesn't see you, but your life isn't fulfilling, and you are empty, and you feel displaced, and because living on the border isn't really living. Because if you want to escape the border, you're gonna have to let Jesus see you in all of your mess, in all of your brokenness. You see, Jesus travels great lengths to see people, especially to see those who live on the border. But you must want to be seen. And the 10 lepers wanted to be seen. And the 10 lepers cried out for mercy, desperately hoping that Jesus would look their way. And the Gospel of Luke says this, that he looked at them. Jesus could have kept walking. Remember, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Yes, it's Palm Sunday. But Jesus in this story is still on his way. And he's up in the border. And he looked at them, and he saw their condition, and he saw their scarred and disfigured bodies and faces, and he heard their desperate cries for mercy. And then from a distance, he didn't go up to them, he didn't touch them, but from a distance, he gave them something to do. Very simple. He said, 
Go and show yourselves to the priests. Okay, really? Go show yourself. That would have meant a lot, by the way, to the nine lepers who were Jewish. What that meant to them was, okay, I'm going to go see the priests. And what happens is, if, if you say, listen, I, I, I have leprosy, but I think it's healing or whatever, you would go to the priest, and the priest would look at you and, and say, okay, you know what? We're going to isolate you for seven days over here in this house where you're not around anybody else. And then in seven days, you're going to come back and I'm going to look at you again. And no other leprosy had formed or no other skin lesion had formed and you had no skin lesions anymore, you would be considered clean. So to them, that was a really positive statement from Jesus. Like something good is going to happen. We are going to be healed. But don't miss something important here. This is, I didn't realize this until I really pondered this scripture Jesus asks all 10 of them to go show themselves to the priests. The Samaritan included. The Samaritan, the enemy of the Jews, the one who doesn't practice, that, that doesn't have the same God, the, that's the one who's supposed to go with the 10 lepers who were Jewish. And this is the weird thing. He probably wouldn't have even been allowed to see the priests. He wouldn't have been allowed to go into the temple. He's a Samaritan. He's unclean. So imagine his thinking. If I go there and I go see the priests, then when they find out I'm a Samaritan, I'm going to hear those words again, unclean. It doesn't matter if I have leprosy or not. I'm unclean to them. The Samaritan leper knew that he was unclean on his skin, but he also knew that the Jews thought he was unclean in his soul. He was the lowest form of human. He was the lowest of the low. And if he went to see the priests, he would go and be rejected all over again. But listen, I love the Samaritan. Because it says in that same verse, it says Jesus looked at them, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. They, all ten, they were all cleaned of their leprosy. And here's what I want you to know. If you want to escape the border, just go. Stop questioning, just go. You see, all 10 of them went, and as they went, they were cleaned. They only knew that Jesus said go. They went without having all the details, and the Samaritan went too, and he knew that he would be rejected when he got there, but instead, he trusted Jesus enough to go because they listened to his simple directive. They experienced a massive miracle. Listen, sometimes, many times, Jesus will ask you to do something and respond to something, and he only gives you enough information so that you take a step. And some of you today may be wondering, you know, I don't hear from Jesus anymore. I'm, you know, I'm just walking along. Listen, let me tell you about let me, the cam, Can the camera follow me? Probably not. Okay, right here. Right, here we go. I'm almost on the border. So what happens is, <laughs> what happens is, God tells you something right here. You want me to go over? All right, I'm going way out. All right, I'm in the dark. That's perfect. So God tells you something here, and then you say, and then you say, I need more information. And I can't, I, can't do, I can't do it, Jesus, and so you keep staying here. But see, what happens is, and you want to go over here, you want to be in this space, you want to be doing what God wants you to do, but you haven't responded to this over here yet. So you're, you want to be here, but you can't go there until you respond to what Jesus said to you in the first place. Does that make sense? So what happens is every single time you listen and every single time you have just enough information to go to the next space, then you start moving in a direction. But many of you are over here and you're wondering why you're not hearing from God. It's because you never responded to God in the first place. You gotta get back over here and then respond. You see, what happened with the leper is the leper even though he knew the potential of rejection, even though he knew that things may not go the way he wanted them to go, it says as he went, he was healed. And God intervened in his life. 
If you want to escape living on the border, you must begin acting upon the things that you believe Jesus is asking you to do without all of the details. Maybe you're still living on the border because you haven't responded to Jesus and you can stay on the border for a a long time. And maybe there's a reason that you feel unfulfilled and your faith is just so-so. Maybe Jesus has asked something of you that you haven't said yes to yet. If you wanna escape the border, just stop questioning and go. Luke 17, go back to that. It says, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. So we know the only one who returned was the Samaritan. And it's ironic that I remember I said that Jews and Samaritans were enemies. Now the Samaritan is kneeling at the feet of a Jew because Jesus was a Jew. The other nine continued on to the priests. We don't know if they made it. We just know they continued on because they were all healed. But the Samaritan came back. And at that moment, there was no more distance between him and Jesus. He could touch Jesus. He stepped right into Jesus' presence and Jesus could touch him. And he fell at Jesus' feet and he thanked him for what he had done. He didn't need to go to the priests. He went back to the one who actually healed him. Amen. Amen. There's nothing more for him to do. But then it goes on, it says, Jesus asked, well, didn't I heal 10 men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. Yeah, but he's already healed. The Samaritan isn't a... He's not a leper anymore, he's healed. That's why he's at Jesus' feet thanking him. So what does Jesus mean when he says, your faith has healed you? When you go back to that exact translation, what he's saying is your faith has saved you. So there's a difference, by the way, in believing Jesus and believing in Jesus. So he believed Jesus enough to go, and he was healed. (laughs) But now something new was going on, right? He had two healings. He had two healings. He had the healing of his physical self, and it happened when he believed enough to respond to Jesus' direction. And as they went, they were healed, all of them. But then he had a second healing. Listen, listen. Listen to what Romans says. Romans 2, 4 Do you not realize that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? God's kindness poured out on 10 lepers. They're all healed, and one of them returns. What is repentance? Repentance is when you are willing to turn from the life over here that you have and surrender your life to the care of of the Almighty, and surrender your dreams and your life, and we talk about that a lot, and literally turn and face Jesus and let Jesus become your Lord. You step down from being the Lord of your own life and you let Jesus be the Lord of your life. You release control of your future and the outcome of your life and place them into Jesus' hands. He had a soul healing, because that's what happens when you do that. Like your soul, is different. Your soul becomes alive. Remember what I said it was like to live on the border where you're alive but you're not really living? Your soul becomes alive. Quickened is what the Bible says. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him and to give life and to give abundant life so that you can live a life that is filled with joy and peace and love and kindness and walk in this world in the middle of the chaos, in the middle of everything we're going through, and you can have an amazing life. Jesus, this is really cool. So Jesus wanted them to be able to join their families. He wanted all of those who were who completely outcast and unable, he wanted them to fellowship with their families and be with them. He wanted them to be able to go get a job again and work. And he wanted them to be able to to get in their community and serve and whatever they were doing. 
But listen, the most important thing he wanted is he wanted them to be able to fellowship with, with God. So there's a double healing. There was the healing physical, the, the blessings of this world that God wants to bless you and let you be in fellowship with others. But there's a spiritual healing because he wants you to be in fellowship with Almighty God. And that's what happened with the Samaritan. He had a double blessing. He had physical healing and he had spiritual healing in one day. If you want to escape the border, you're gonna to have to return to Jesus just like the Samaritan did. Because some of you are alive, but you're not really living. And some of you have received blessing upon blessing, but you have ignored the work of Jesus. Some of you have, have said, you get this new job, you say, well, I did ask some people to pray for me, and, I was, and you get this amazing job, and then you say, well, you know, I'm just really smart, and I put my resume out there, so I got the job. And it, it's kind of a coincidence that people were actually praying for me at the same time. Or, or somebody was healed, and you say, yeah, but they had really good doctors. You can explain away anything you want. But here's the thing. Remember this, nine lepers didn't return. The majority of the people, listen, they could have gone to the priest and said, walking along, oh, we're healed. <laughs> Get to the priest and then say, well, you know what? It's probably the priest who healed us. He knew we were coming. So it, it couldn't have been, you know, it's just a coincidence that Jesus told us to go see the, the priest. He never said he was going to heal us. We're just walking along and we're healed. I think it's because we were going back to the priest. Anything can become coincidental. You can explain away anything. But Jesus wants you to be free from living in the border. And he wants you to understand that he is kind and loving and good. And Jesus takes the person who is the very lowest and he blessed him with blessing upon blessing. The real borderland living on this border is not recognizing God at work in your life. Not giving God the credit that he deserves. Not falling at the feet of Jesus because of everything that he's blessed you with. When you focus on the negative and you're not focusing on his greatness, that's borderline. That's borderland and that's living on the border. Your real border is having enough information about Jesus to see his kindness but never experiencing his power of transformation in your life. And Jesus asked the Samaritan to stand up and go. <laughs> Where did he go? Once again, just a little bit of information. Okay, stand up and go. Well, where do you want me to go? Just go. You know where I think he went? I think he went back to the border. And I think this is what he did. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me i once was lost but now i'm found was blind but now i see that was what he did that's what we're called to do so today i want you to take a moment as the praise team comes and i want you to think are you on the border? Because today, you can decide on 2021, Palm Sunday, you saw those people that are getting baptized. They'd been baptized before. They just want that second blessing, I think. They're looking to, be, they're looking to serve God and surrender everything they have to God. They remembered their baptism. They went back, and maybe you need to do that today. You can do that, but if you've never decided to follow Jesus and you want out of the border and you want to leave that place, you can do that today as well. And before they sing, I'm going to ask all of you just to bow your heads. And I'm going to say a prayer. And if you've never say, said this prayer before, if you want to turn your life over to Jesus, I'm going to lead you in it. 
Jesus, I'm here. Jesus, I surrender my life to you today in this moment. I don't know what that means, but I don't want to live on the border anymore. I want you to be my Lord, and I want to turn from the life that's not giving me anything at all. I want to know you personally. So I'm kneeling at your feet. I'm confessing my sin and my inadequacy and my disfigurement. And I'm asking you to be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.